What do sword guards tell us about the use of swords, particularly looking here at the Renaissance all the way up to the modern era? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now this is part two of a massive video and if you haven't seen part one yet, I deal with everything up to about the year 1500, so up to the 15th century, in the previous video. So make sure you check out that. I'll put the link below. In this video, we're going to be looking at around 1500 onwards, all the way through the Victorian era to the modern age. And we're going to consider what simply looking at the design of a guard on a sword can tell us about its probable use. Before I go on, I want to mention that this video is very kindly sponsored by Skillshare. And the first thousand of you to click that link below is absolutely free. No obligations will get an absolutely free trial of Skillshare. There's hundreds and hundreds of stuff on there. Um, I've been looking at some stuff to do with photography this morning, but they've also got metalworking and all kinds of stuff. Check out that link. If you're one of the first thousand, you get free access to Skillshare right now. But more about that later in this video. So as we approach the year 1500, there are a whole bunch of hilts which have started to appear by this point. As we've seen, we've got guards that have knuckle bows. We've got guards that have fingerings, that are starting to have a nargle or a side ring, side protection. And so hilts, of, uh, guards in specific, are starting to get increasingly more complex. But one of the most common types of guard that we see at this period, most popular, and is going to be growing and becoming even more important as it develops with time uh, in coming decades, is the, essentially we could call it a side sword hilt. That is a hilt which has fingerings, a cross guard, sometimes a knuckle bow. So by the time we start to get to these, what I refer to as complex hilts, we've got finger rings, we've got side rings, we've got a knuckle bow. This is telling us quite a lot about how the sword is used. Now, if we look at different side swords, they don't all have the same protection. This doesn't have a large side ring at the side, for example. Many of them don't have a knuckle bow. And these can tell us subtle things about the, how that particular sword was intended by its owner or creator to be used. So some of them, for example, might be from a system which is held with the hand lower and with the hand more retracted and closer to the bottom, bot um, lower down, further away from the opponent, something like Vigiani. And if we look at Vigiani or Dalagoki, there's, there's more um, parallels to earlier systems, I would say, in general, uh, even Morozzo as well. So in those systems, because you don't have a huge amount of hand protection, and you might be giving more cuts, you maybe don't need certain things on the handguard so much, okay? But as we get into the rapier age, and which is very much, uh, there's a crossover here, and side swords and rapiers exist at the same time, and you could say are the same swords, they're just different uh, parts of the spectrum. Then again, and this is actually a recreation of a 17th century sword, but it's got a hilt, a swept hilt that's quite similar to some 16th century ones. We can start to see hilts like this provide a lot of protection, but there's certain things they don't do. Now, if we contrast this, now I've done a recent video, so I won't repeat everything I said in that. But if we contrast, for example, with the Spanish or Southern Italian cup hilt, you can clearly see that the swept hilt, and these are completely contemporary, these, were, these designs were around exactly the same time in the 17th century, you can see that the cup hilt has a very different emphasis to the swept hilt. They both provide good levels of hand protection compared to all the swords we're looking at here. However, the Spanish cup hilt has very long cross guard and it has a cup hilt. Now that's part and parcel of the ways that these were often used, often with a very extended arm, and the cross is used as a very active part of the defense while keeping the point on line. Because the point's on line, you've got a large cup, and I'm now hiding my hand and my forearm behind the cup, and the cross guard is very important for diverting the opponent's point coming around my cup, essentially. So if the point starts to come around the cup, I can turn the guard, divert it, and put my own point in in the same time. With this type of sword, these are certainly in the treatises, more often used in a lower hand um, position with the hand further away from the opponent. They're not usually shown held, presented forward like this, because you, as you can see, there's lots of openings for things to come through here. So instead of presenting the hand very close to the opponent's blade or point, um, and in a straight line, because I'm not hiding anything behind a swept hilt. Instead, the swept hilt would more commonly be kept lower. Uh, and this type of sword is also used uh, in a way that's perhaps, in some ways, you could argue a little bit more similar to earlier side sword, so-called side sword systems. 
So we can learn a lot about this. We can also learn a lot about how they're held. So one of the ways that we can learn about how they're held is length of grip and style of pommel, but I'm not gonna talk about that in this video because this is only about guards. But let's just talk about the size of the rings inside. So very often in these Spanish cup hilts, there is enough space for you to put two fingers in. Uh, so if you slide two fingers in, your hand is now closer to the center of balance. It's further inside the cups. So you're getting more protection from the cup and you're also getting greater control over the sword uh, because you've got more your, the cross guard is going between your two upper two and lower two fingers and your hand is closer to the point of balance. So it really changes how the sword handles and how it's held uh, and maneuvered. So in this case, just contrasting these two rapiers, there can be a really huge difference between how two rapiers with two different style hilts might uh, um, how, how they might be intended to be used and really how you can uh, capitalize on the maximum advantages or disadvantages of each type of hilt. Now obviously swordsmanship is a skill that I've devoted a huge amount of my life to but there are a whole bunch of other skills that I like to practice and you can practice too and you can learn new skills with Skillshare which I've got a free offer for you straight down below. You can try it right now with no obligations. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different classes. And it's got members in over 150 different countries around the world. There are hundreds of classes there which might be applicable to your job or your hobbies or just self-improvement. You can see here it's got classes in animation, creative writing, film and video, fine art, graphic design, illustration, music, photography, web development, business analytics, marketing, it goes on and on. There's absolutely tons on Skillshare. But if you click on that free link down below, you can check it out for yourself right now. Maybe you want to brush up your skills on a creative skill you've already got, or you want to learn something completely new. All of those things are catered for on Skillshare. If you're anything like me, you've got crazy busy days with not a lot of free time, but why don't you set aside a little bit of time for yourself and self-improvement? Brand new classes being launched every single week, and everything on there is available with subtitles in French, German, Spanish, and Portuguese. Most recently, I've actually been doing this together with Lucy to brush up on my portrait photography. I've been looking at portrait photography, the photographer's guide to capturing mood and emotion. And this is hosted by Abuka Mordi, who's a Nigerian portrait and fashion photographer. I absolutely love the straightforward way that he presents things, new ideas that he's given me as well, and little tricks and tips about how to use your camera and lighting to improve the photos and the impact of the photos you take that you might be using in thumbnails or you might be using in family photographs. As you guys know, I often have to produce portraits of myself for thumbnails for both videos on my channel, but also for pictures for other people's channels, also websites, publicity things, news. And here you can see a few quick shots that Lucy actually shot of me for something that's going to be coming up on IGN soon. So how do you try it out? Very simple. You click the link below. The first thousand of you, only the first thousand, so be quick, only the first thousand are going to get an absolute free trial of Skillshare. And you can watch the heck out of it, try as much of it as you like, and it's not going to be time wasted. Absolutely free, no obligations. First thousand of you, click that link below. As we go into the 18th century, there are two types of swords which I think are really worth mentioning here um, because they're distinct from what has gone before. That is the basket hilt, basket hilt broadsword, and the small sword. Clearly, completely almost opposite ends of the spectrum for types of sword by 18th century standards anyway. Now, the basket hilted sword, quite simply, is very clearly meant for a cut predominant style. We know this, and not to say that they weren't used to thrust with, they absolutely were, but they have a very cut dominant types of blade, and we know from the systems surviving in, in the um, treatises that we have that they are used most, well, yeah, most of the time pretty much to cut, um, and, and they are used to thrust as well. They are cut and thrust swords, but the hilts are, whilst they are some level of protection against thrusts, they are clearly set up predominantly to be protection against cuts. Okay, we can see that they have bars inside and outside, front and top and bottom and all around to protect from any kind of cut. And we know that they were often held in positions, for example, um, straight out, almost like a pugilism stance. Um, with a sword and taj, they were sometimes held like this, pretty much either side of the head, a bit like a boxer. Uh, sometimes they were held point forward like that. 
Um, and sometimes they were held in more like a sabre guard, and we'll talk about sabres in due course. And very often they were held in a, extremely commonly in England, held in a hanging guard up here, or up here, something like this, okay, or prim. Um, so they were often held tilt forward, bold as brass because they know they've got a massive basket of iron protecting the hand and so that tells us a lot about how they were held but it also tells us about how you can or can't uh, cut or thrust with them. I've talked a lot about this in the past but there are certain types of basket hilt which kind of preclude you from making certain types of straight thrust because you just don't have space enough in the basket and the basket gets in the way of your ha bottom of your hand near your wrist um, at the bottom here. So they tell us a huge amount about how they were used but we also know how they were used from the treatises and it completely confirms this particular style of hilt. Um, the other thing that should be mentioned though is they are somewhat vulnerable to thrusts. Now some of these, in fact I've got one right here, have a um, liner in and a lot of people think these liners are decorative but actually they're made of buff white leather on the inside uh, and then usually felt, usually red but not always, on the outside. So that kind of plugs the holes and anybody can realise that if you have a fight that is broadsword versus small sword, there is a danger of the small sword point thrusting the person in the hand or wrist by going through the basket of the hilt. So having a liner in there, even if it's made of leather, is certainly better than nothing. But it should be pointed out that unlike the uh, cup hilt, for example, which doesn't offer any places for a point to go into the hand, the basket hilt absolutely does. And in fact, if we hold the basket hilt online, point online, it's got some pretty big holes in the top here. So that tells us that this is not predominantly a thrusting sword. It is predominantly a sword that's intended to be dealing with cuts, heavy cuts as well. And it, undoubtedly the strongest type of hilt against cuts not fantastic against thrusts, I have to say. Now, in many ways, the small sword is the opposite of the basket hilted broadsword or backsword, um, in that essentially it's appalling levels of protection against cuts. You don't have the long cross guards of a cup hilt rapier or an earlier arming sword or side sword. Uh, you've got a very flimsy knuckle bow, and I'll talk about the knuckle bow in a second. You've got a pair of finger rings, so that tells us something about the use. It's obviously a thrust-centric sword. An interesting detail, the finger rings on small swords are usually, not always, but usually much smaller than the finger rings we find on side swords and rapiers. One of the reasons for that is the finger is not usually inserted, although you can physically do it on this one, this is quite an early one, um, is not usually inserted through the finger ring. Most texts divide against that and they actually just place the finger against the finger ring as a point of leverage and control. Um, but yeah, you've got a flim flimsy knuckle bow, so you're not even a committed blow, although there's a knuckle bow there, a committed blow from a broadsword or backsword is likely to break that and blast through it, possibly even cut straight through it. And then you've got a small shell, a small disc. Now this is an interesting thing. So of all of the protection on this hilt, on this guard rather, it's very clear that it is designed to be used in various uh, point forward ways, held in point forward ways. And we know that from foil fencing, but we know that from small sword treatises. So whether it's with an extended or a retracted arm, overall the encounters between one small sword and another are going to be point forward and you're not usually doing things that require you to have the point drastically offline, although that is found in small sword texts, and there are sometimes occasions where if someone swings a sabre or a backsword at you, you're obliged to parry this way, uh, because that's the only way you can stop the blade. You can't do a really shallow uh, cart or um, uh, half circle guard or something like that, because it will just get blasted through by the heavier, more powerful sword. But they are extremely light and extremely nimble. So the smallness of the guards on small swords is, you could argue, partly for wearing convenience, but it's also partly because this sword is all about smallness, lightness, quickness, and really that's where the advantage of the small sword lies. Most people who have tried to have a small sword fight against a rapier are at a huge disadvantage. The rapier's way, way longer, got way more hand protection, it can cut quite powerfully compared to a small sword, which usually can't cut at all. Um, so the rapier has all kinds of protection, but one advantage that the small sword has is its absolute lightning speed. Okay, it's got a lack of reach, it's got a lack of hand protection, but it's super quick. So if you started putting loads of hand protection on a small sword, you'd make it heavier, you'd lose the one main advantage it has. So, 
That tells us the design of this guard tells us that yes, it is a point forward thrust centric sword pr primarily designed that guards primarily there to protect your hand against other small swords. And frankly, you just kind of accept that against someone using something like a basket hilt broadsword, which was around at the same time, your hands are screwed <laughs> if you try and uh, defend anywhere near the hand in a way that might hit the hand. OK, um, you'd have to put a lot more hilt on here to protect against that kind of sword, which would rob you of the main advantage of the small sword. So this is all about lightness, quickness, avoidance um, and getting that point in not really much about the hand protection. So much so, in fact, that the original practice foils for foil fencing, which was the practice for small sword fencing, don't even have shells. They actually have a, an open figure eight guard. So if you try and defend with the guard in foil fencing with an old fashioned foil, you just get stabbed in the hand. So there's almost an emphasis on the training to not rely on protecting your hand with the hilt you must protect with the blade. And we're gonna finish off with sabers in the 19th century, which were the, the main type of swords being used. Now, obviously I've talked a lot about sabers in the past and I'll go into deeper dive videos in the future. There are sabers which just have a simple knuckle bow and with those you have to use them, hold them in a certain way, use them in a certain way. The hand is vulnerable. You've only got a vaguely similar, I mean, you've got a similar level of hand protection uh, to the uh, Langmesser, for example, okay? So you've essentially just got a knuckle bow and a rear quill on, sometimes a little projection of some sort at the side, an added bar or something. So with those sabers, indeed, whilst they were sometimes held frontally, you've got to be fully aware that the hand is vulnerable to thrusts and cuts, and you've got to be ready to void the hand a lot of the time. And in fact, those types of hilts, when they were first invented, were probably predominantly used in the same guard positions as the Langmesser and the Dussac were. Uh, and I would say they are Dussacs, essentially, they're late period Dussacs. So, um, the more developed type of what we call a half basket hilt. So, this was always a compromise. It was a lighter, more versatile guard than the full basket hilt, um, but it doesn't offer as much, as much protection. From the front, it does. From the top, arguably, it offers, it offers even slightly more protection. But from the sides, it is open. And that's why it's called a half basket hilt. This is a full basket. This is a half basket because it is a basket from the front and the top. It is not a basket on either of the sides. It's open at the sides. And the advantage you gain from it being open at the sides is a greater level of uh, movement and freedom and less weight on the sword essentially. Okay, so you can maneuver, you can more easily get the blade, uh, the point online by slipping the hand down and putting the thumb up the back of the uh, back strap. And additionally, um, it's, it's less likely to clash with uh, any part of your hand or wrist in any kind of use. Uh, but as I say, it has less protection. But what does this tell us about saber use? Well, it tells us, and we know this from the manuals, pretty much all parries, there are a couple of exceptions, but pretty much all parries are done with the base of the front edge. You have a huge amount of protection here. You've got a massive broad knuckle bow there, and you've got a huge amount of protection at the top here, not dissimilar to a cup hilt rapier. So whether you're holding the sword point online with a retracted arm or an extended arm, you've got a huge amount of protection to the front. But equally, if you're standing in a garb more like this, um, terse or high terse, then you've got a lot of protection to the side from cuts, as well as blows coming down here. So whether you're point on or point offline, you've got a huge amount of frontal protection and when you're parrying, whether it's um, head guard for example, or cart, or terse, or preem, the blows are coming down in the direction of the edge because you're parrying with the base of the edge and that is the direction in which most of the guard is. And this is true of cutlasses as well. So uh, that's been a fairly massive video. I've covered all periods of sword use really from the ancient world and you could extrapolate all the things I said from the ancient world all the way back to the Bronze Age era as well when swords don't really have much of a handguard, just a little tiny bit of a handguard arguably to keep the hand in place. But those swords are almost always used with shields. As we come into the medieval period, cross guards get longer, then gradually cross guards get enhanced with uh, finger rings, side rings or side nargles or shells, 
knuckle bows and then gradually the bars get added that becomes the rapier then we got the cup hilt where essentially the cup replaces a lot of the bars and covers the area more completely we've got the basket hilt then the small sword a very different approach to things and then finally in the 19th century we have saber and cutlass hilts i hope that's been a, a worthwhile run through all of what sword guards can tell us about how different swords are used and deployed and held in fencing positions and used in combat. Um, as always, if you've liked this video, please show it with a thumbs up, uh, share the video around, make sure you're subscribed, and I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.